that. Uh, yes, indeed, we all, three of us, come from far flung places, Sacramento, Stockton, and that most strange distant land, Oakland. <laughs> uh, you remember that down there at uh, Adeline, there was the here and there, a little bit of Berkeley snobbishness. Uh, Oakland, of course, being there, and Oakland, of course, sometimes beats a little pat on the back. There, 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 there. <laughs> uh, my early Berkeley days are really around in the stadium. My father and uncle were big football fans. So I think I was five years old. We went to the uh, Cal St. Mary's game. And my father typically lost the car where the car was. I, I think I told him, Daddy, I think it's a, a street named for a hat. And he said, uh, Derby. And I said, yeah. <laughs> In the high school, another rediscovery of Berkeley, uh, there used to be that smoke shop on the corner of Bancroft and Telegraph. And that little guy in there that looked like Humphrey Bogart, I'm sure some of you know his name. Uh, I think I was 15 years old and we were buying cigarettes. Um, and he, I had just smashed up my finger and I had a bandage on it, and he had a bandage on his, and I thought, ah, similarity, and I said, oh, look, me too. And he had this burnly look on his face, and he said, oh, it's just a destruction of the body image. <laughs> Berkeley was the place I learned uh, that you don't call them movies, you call them films. And that was the Pauline Kale of the Cinema Guild, right, on Telegraph, so we had to say film. Um, just, to, just a question that people always ask, uh, how did you and Maxine meet? Well, pretty romantically, I think her roommate was dating my best friend, and we were the sort of tag-along date. Um, those two are no longer dating. <laughs> Skip forward a little bit. Um, Berkeley High. I know Nancy Rubin taught at Berkeley High. How many people here went to Berkeley High? There are a few, a few of you. And you know, uh, everybody's a transplant from places further away than Oakland. But teaching at Berkeley High was an amazing experience. Um, 1967. Um, yeah, tranquilizers. I, if anybody's had any experience of teaching high school, you do need tranquilizers or something stronger. But I wasn't taking anything stronger at the time in 1967 when I was teaching there. And I saw that many of these kids, especially after lunch, were coming back to school stoned out of their minds. And I thought, well, I'd experiment a little bit so I'd better talk about it. And I talked about it in class, and I told them, you have to be very careful, because there's some very bad drugs on the street, and some people do not come back. And it's true, we have a friend who did not come back, a very bright young poet, and he did not come back. So I didn't think it was out of hand to talk about that. But, and here's a little sociology lesson. Here's the Berkeley Daily Gazette. Do you remember the Berkeley Daily Gazette? And uh, <laughs> our most reliable newspapers. Berkeley Daily Gazette, March 8, 1967, front page. Teacher quizzed over LSD. <laughs> <laughs> A first year Berkeley High School English teacher is under investigation today for teaching students the effects of LSD trips, which he took. When asked last night by the Gazette for his version of the charge, he had no comment. <laughs> and had suggested the Gazette contact the school department. This isn't too long. <laughs> the Gazette had already con contacted the, uh, con yeah, confirmed the allegation with Berkeley High School officials. A spokesman said the teacher was taking LSD under a psychiatrist's supervision. <laughs> Several students contacted by the Gazette also confirmed the teacher's methods, but further added he taught the class while under the influence of a hallucinogenic. <laughs> no, no, it 
thousand times no. no. Students confirm. Several students contacted by the Gazette also confirmed the teacher's methods, but further added he caught the glass while under the influence of the hallucinogenic drug and allowed uh, uh, H2 column 21. This is really good. Oh, um, yeah, asparagus is 29 cents a pound. Of <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, it allowed them to, to do anything they wanted to during class. You know? <laughs> the teacher is alleged to have said, "Somebody's got to tell these kids about." It. That's true. That is true. The Berkeley High School teacher is said to be about 23 or 24. That's very complimentary. I was 29. <laughs> Trip talk teaching. Apparently occurred last September, according to this investigation, and it is not known whether it was on more than one occasion or whether he has exposed this semester's students to information on narcotic effects. I'd love to be the person who wrote this. This is really good. Um, school officials said they received protests from at least one parent and one student on the teacher's classroom subject. One parent told the Gazette she observed the teacher on a recent PTA panel, and he sat and acted funny. <laughs> you, you can't believe everything you read. You read. funny now. <laughs> At the time it was really scary because you're going to lose your job. And one way that we could prove that he did not act funny at PTA meetings was he never went to a PTA meeting. <laughs> I love a broad margin to my life. And when, when I say margin, or when Thoreau said, I love a broad margin to my life, uh, I'm thinking about time. And uh, I want lots of time. Uh, uh, broad, broad expanses of time. And so at the beginning of the book, I'm thinking about um, growing old which uh, now also, uh, now it seems funny because I was only going to turn 65. <laughs> and this was 10 years ago, but at the time I thought, oh my god, 65, uh, this is very old. I am turning 65 years of age. In two weeks, I will be 65 years old. I can accumulate time and lose time. I sit here writing in the dark. Can't see to change these pencil words. Just like my mother, alone, bent over her writing. Just like my father, bent over his writing, alone. But for me, watching. She got out of bed, wrapped herself in a blanket, and broke down the strange sounds Father, who was dead, was intoning to her. He was reading aloud calligraphy that he'd written, carved with ink brush on his tombstone. She wasn't writing an answer. She wasn't writing a letter. Who was she writing to? Nobody. This well-deep outpouring is not for anything. Yet we have to put into exact words what we are given to see, hear, know. Mother's eyesight blurred. She saw trash as flowers. Oh, how beautiful. She was lucky, seeing beauty, living, living in beauty, whether or not it was there. I am off 
often looking in mirrors and singling out my face in group photographs. Am I pretty at 65? What does old look like? Sometimes I am wrinkled, sometimes not. So much depends upon lighting. <laughs> A camera crew shot pictures of me. One of five most influential people over 60 in the East Bay. <laughs> I am homely. I am old. I look like a tortoise in a curly white wig. <laughs> I am stretching head and neck toward the light. Such effort to lift the head, to open the eyes, black, shiny, lashless eyes, talking mouth. I must utter you something. My wrists are crossed in my lap. Wrinkles run up my forearm, my left forearm. It's my right shoulder that hurts. Rollerblading accident. Does the pain show? Does my hiding it? I should have spoken up. Don't take my picture. Not in that glare. One side of my neck and one cheek are gone in black shadow. Nobody looks good in hard focus, high contrast. Black sweater and skirt, white hair, white sofa, white curtains. My colors and my home, but rearranged. The crew had pushed the reds and greens and blues aside. The photographer, a young woman, said, great, great. From within my body, I can't sense that crease on my left cheek. I have to get wind compliments. You are beautiful. So cute, such a kind of face. You are simple, you move fast. Chocolate chip. A student I taught long ago called me chocolate chip. And only yesterday, a lifelong friend told Earl, my husband, he's, he's lucky, he's got me, the chocolate chip. <laughs> They think I mean, they mean I think my round face and round bead eyes. I keep count. I mind that I be good looking. I don't want to look like grandmother. Ah, poor. Her likeness is the mask of tragedy. An ape weeps when another ape weeps. She is ancestress. She is prayed to. She sits, the queen, center of the family in China, center of the family portrait. My mother in it, too. Generations of in-laws around her. All is black and white, but for a dot of jade green at Paul's ears, and a curve of jade green at her wrist. Lotus lily feet show from the hem of her gown. She wanted to be a beauty. She lived to be 100. My mother lived to be 100. 103, she said. Chinese lie about their age, <laughs> making themselves older. Or maybe she was 97 when the lady official from Social Security visited her, as the government visits everyone who claims a 100th birthday. Ma showed off. She pedaled her exercise bike, hammer curled hot pink barbells, suddenly stopped. What if Sozo Security won't believe she's a hundred uh, a century old? Here's a way for calculating age. Subtract from her age of death, my age now. One hundred minus sixty-five equals thirty-five. I am 35 years to go. Lately, I've been writing a book a decade. I have time to write three more books. Jane Austen wrote six books. I've written six books. 
Hers are six big ones. Mine, four big ones and two small ones. <laughs> I take refuge in numbers. I waste my time with Sudoku. Day dawns I'm greedy, helpless to begin. Six star difficulty Sudoku. Sun goes down. I'm still stuck for that square that will, that will let the numbers fly into place. What good am I getting out of this? I'm not stopping time. Nothing to show for my expenditures. Pure nothing. So this title, I love a broad margin to my life. Margin also means boundaries and borders. And uh, I'm wearing a, a, a safety pin for safety for refugees, and on it I have a medal, and it's it's a medal for Father Toribio Romo. He is the saint of immigrants. Uh, I am going to read you uh, another section of, uh, of this book, and. I am uh, in China, and I am on a tourist visa in China, and on the plane, I meet an immigrant. Once I was on an airplane beside a village girl in the window seat. At takeoff, I asked her, where are you going? in surprise and grabbed a hold of my hand. You speak like me. Yes, I speak Sayyid language. Are you from the village? No, my mama and papa came from Sayyid villages. They left for New York. They lived in New York, then California. I was born in California. I feel like a child younger than this girl. I'm telling about parents as if I still had them. I'm talking in my baby language. Why? She exclaimed, loud as though yelling across fields. I am going to New York. I am meeting my husband in New York. He's waiting for me in New York. He works in a restaurant. He's rented a home. He sent for me and waits for me. She did not let go of my hand. I held hers tightly as we flew the night sky. She looked in wonder at webs of lights below. Red, red, green, green, she said. Red, red, green, green, my mother used to say, meaning, oh, how pretty. The lights were white and yellow too, and gold, blue, copper, and above, stars and stars. Mother, Mama, as you leave the village family you'll never see again. Grandfather walked her as far as he could walk, stood weeping in the road until she could not see him anymore when she turned around to look. She's off to that lonely country from where he, from where he returned broke. I felt that I was dying. Mama, girl, you are not traveling alone. I am traveling with you, here, holding your hand. I know that country you're leaving for and shall guide you there. I know your future. I'm your child from the future. Your husband will certainly meet you. Baba will be at the East Broadway station. You will recognize each other, though he be dressed modern Western style. You will have a good, safe life. You will have many children and live a long, long life. You will be lucky. You are lucky. Your husband has work. He's rented an apartment and made you a home. He saves money. He bought your plane ticket. He will be waiting for you at the airport. 
she listened to the wise old woman teaching her. But how to instruct anyone the way to make an American life? How to have a happy marriage? For a long time in the dark, dozing, dreaming, thinking, we sat without speaking, without letting go of warm hands. The red, red, green, green appeared again. I told her, that's Japan. We're over Japan now. We'll be landing soon in Narita. Wow, you speak Japanese too. <laughs> she admires me too much. Inside the horrible confusion of the international airport, how can a mind from the village not fall to crazy pieces? I found a nice American couple making the connecting flight to New York and asked them please to take this Chinese girl to the right gate. She thanked me. She asked, she said goodbye. See you again. Join in. She did not look back. Good. Gotta go. Things to do. People to meet. Places to be. encourage people who are writing but they can't get published. It's, uh, it's to help uh, uh, activists who do some little gesture, who go on a, a, a march and then you think, well, what's the use? Uh, does it really do any good? The true poet crosses eternal distances. Perfect reader, come, though 1,000 years from now. Poem can also reach reader born 1,000 years before the poem. Wish it into being. Lee by and do food. Lucky sea turtles found each other within their lifetimes. Oh, but these are hopeful superstitions of Chinese time and Chinese poets. I think non-poets live in the turning and returning cosmos this way. An act of love I do this morning saves a life on a far future battlefield. And the surprising love I feel that saves my life comes from a person whose soul, somehow corresponding with my soul, doing me a good deed 1,000 years ago. Um, I'm going to uh, read to you the last uh, couple of sentences in the fifth book of peace. And uh, I'm happy to tell you that this is now a, uh, it's a meme on the internet. Children, everybody, here's what to do during war. In a time of destruction, create something. A poem, a parade, a friendship, a community, a place that is the commons, a school, a vow a moral principle, one peaceful moment. acted funny. <laughs> it's not in the past. He still acts funny. <laughs> and Maxine also acts funny. <laughs> what I'm going to do is first read you a very brief essay 
that I wrote um, that accompanies a little booklet on some of my drawings. So I'll read this first, it won't take but a minute, and then I'll show you some slides that will present mainly drawings but also some paintings so that you can see the connection. Can you hear me? Drawing. I don't remember a beginning. It was always there. What I do remember is an assignment given me by my mother on bright chilly days. The assignment was to enter what she called the other reality. Seated on a folding chair, my back to the window, I faced the wall alive with shadow and shade. Birds, trees, insects, leaves, branches, and the occasional sweep of rain moved in magical, elaborate choreographies. Nothing was still. Whatever appeared was well on its way to being something other. Identities merged. A bird sported a large bushy tail and was topped by a leafy head. Branches were gnarled fingers, tremulous edges, linear bits of this and that. Strict attention to this panorama of incessant movement was required. And then, after some minutes had passed, I was asked to render what I had witnessed into stories and drawings. And so, for me, the literary and the visual were inseparably wed. I walk with this. I think, talk, dream, and breathe this other reality much of the time. My drawing proceeds from this place. William Trevor says of the short story that it is the art of the glimpse, that it should be an explosion of truth, and that its strength lies in what it leaves out as much as what it puts in. This is also true of drawing and what I so love about it. At its best, drawing is a glimpse and an explosion of truth. It is bony, essential, and real. So it's a fine place, this other reality, drawing. Really, it's the best place for drawing this possibility, enticing, intriguing, and endless. And what, what, what could be better than that? Okay, so now I'm going to go back there, and we'll turn on the projector. And I wish the room were a little bit more darkenable, uh, so that the slides would be have greater clarity. But I think it will give you at least some kind of a glimpse of what I do. Thank you. Let's see, I need a microphone. You need a microphone? Yes, I do. or wave your hands. There's a little noise from the projector. I hope it will die down after the first minute or two, just in case, if you can't hear well. Mainly I'm showing you my drawings today because drawing is the basis of everything that I do as a visual artist. drawings started to happen about 10 years out of graduate school. I got my first degree in English and then my second uh, um, sort of bachelor's degree and then master's degree in studio art at Berkeley. And for the first 10 years I was out of graduate school, uh, when I looked back I thought I was working much too much out of my education and not nearly enough out of myself. So I began to explore other possibilities and to try to enter different terrains in order to find work which felt uh, more authentic. I was looking at the paintings of Franz Klein, and unfortunately I could not find any slides of his work to show you so that you can refer to them. Some of you probably know his work. He was a major artist in Century America, internationally acclaimed and for very good reason. The last name, Klein, it's A-L-I-N-E, um, the H-Y-Y that came up. He did large, black and white, rather holographic paintings 
which I felt absolutely in love with. It was also the work of Archell Gorky, William B. Cushion, Helen Frankenthal, Joan Mitchell, and um, a gazillion people from the past. David, David uh, Smith, the great American sculptor, said that every piece of work of art encompassed all that had been done before it. And I believe the same thing. So I feel that whatever whatever merit my work has, uh, my indebtedness to so much of the past is uh, is profound. So these are pieces. I started reading about Klein and his process. And one of the things that I had One of the things that I had gleaned from my 10 years out of school was that my modus was reductive, not additive. By which I mean that if I started with a lot, or if I started with something, the only way I could find my way was to reduce it to keep paring it down. So I went back to drawing from painting, and I started covering sheets of paper with very soft graphite. And it was basically a kind of scramble of lines across the picture plane. And when I did that, oh, this is so hard to see, but anyway, when I did that, if you look at the little booklet later, you'll see these things uh, with greater clarity. When I did that, I found that by entering the scramble of lines with my eraser, not erasing along the line, but erasing through the line, the issue from the graphite was picked up and displayed into the pictorial space. And when that happened, I think these smudges, marks, nuances, and so forth that I couldn't possibly think of. Um, but they appeared, and so then the space itself became active rather than passive. And this I knew was something that I wanted. I didn't want stillness. It didn't seem real to me in my work. Now this is... Uh, this is the one slide that I was able to get having to do with my indebtedness. This was done 18,000 years ago, off from Europe. And these are paintings. I'm sure you've seen them too, in reproduction of not in person. Just a knockout. I don't know if you remember, but Sister Wendy Beckett did a presentation that was on television, what, back in the late 80s and the 90s. And one of the things she said that always stayed with me was that Art is not progressive. It doesn't get better. It either is or it isn't. And I think if you think back to the cave paintings, they are so astonishing and they stand. It never got better. It never got better. Okay. So this is the first translation. If that's what you were, I would call it. Um, say from certain drawings into painting. This is large scale, six or seven feet square. And the process involved working with very thin uh, colors, burnt sienas, ochres, burnt numbers. I'd like to work I would like to work with earth colors at this time because they had an authenticity that synthetic color doesn't have, at least for me. So I would work with a very thin wash, the paint would be wet, it would be running, and then I would draw into it with black lines of oil. I'd work the whole painting through, I'd heat it, I'd go after it with a solvent again, things would dissolve, I'd go back at it again another time. I would work sometimes for 10 to 12 hours in space. Stephen de Stalmer, who's working right now, is a really wonderful Bay Area sculptor. He died a few years ago. He said that in order to get to a piece, he often had to be exhausted. You know, you usually think of being high energy when you start work. I'm very high energy, and I usually start in the morning when I'm most high energy. But I found with these paintings, because they just were so elusive, I would have to work sometimes 10 or 12 hours, and then I was so cooked out, I had no defenses. And then I got to the painting. So this one is called On Again. Simple declarative. Same process. Egyptian chapter. Same process. These are about seven by five feet. Swamp fever. 
you really can't see the paintings in this particular setting, and I'm sorry to say, but um, they're out there. These you can see a little better. These I started about 10 years ago, and I gave myself an assignment. I felt that I was very strong in line, very strong in space, pictorial space, composition, um, not so strong in color, and uh, very weak in shape. So I gave myself an assignment that often given to students to develop a shape vocabulary, and that was working with one object, Mine happens to be a green pepper. Work with one object and make yourself do hundreds of shapes based on one object. And of course, it gets tedious and tiresome, so after a while, you invent, you amplify, you amplify, you do everything. And you start getting things smooth or anything like tired potatoes into interesting shapes. My hope was that when I developed the shape vocabulary, which I would work on at night, upstairs about my studio that at some point I would internalize this and so when I went back to painting the shapes would appear and so when I went back to painting I only allowed myself to work with black I didn't want the complications of color and so for about six months I worked with only black and only really boring black painting to look like higher versions of what I'd done before and then after about six months the shapes began to come in and I went. So I got this one. This is called First Garden. And this is called Dark Safari. This is a drawing of charcoal. While I was doing the paintings, the school where I taught, CCA, was attempting to merge it with the San Francisco Art Institute and as a member of the painting and drawing faculty, I was required to be on the Brazilian committees and meetings. I can't paint the interruption I have, and I uh, have a long days without that interruption to do that. So I went to working on these huge sheets of paper, 80 inches high, sometimes that much across, working with charcoal. And all the light that you see is through erasure. And it was really wonderful, fun to do these. I actually had an experience where I thought my work is not messaging. It doesn't come out of that particular place for me. But I thought maybe, with this process, I think I'm inventing. I could be called a feminist artist because what I was doing, I was working on the drawing, uh, and lines, the white lines were coming through with an eraser. And I had a shop back in my studio, and I would have to clean up the residue from the charcoal when it fell to the floor. And I did that with my shop back, and then I thought, I wonder what would happen if I put the shop back on the drawing <laughs> to make big, broad lines. And I just sailed. I was having the best time, and then all of a sudden I realized that all the push pins that were holding the drawing to the wall had popped out, and my whole drawing got stuck in <laughs> Oh, it's all right. I did love it. Then the uh, drawings went to uh, New York for an exhibition and some sold and the other ones came back and I didn't want to store them but I didn't want to throw them out. And I had discovered when I was working on these big drawings when I would ready them for presentation that I had to cut the sides very carefully because before they didn't help with the mat knife and it was too rough. When I cut the sides very carefully, the mark paper fell on the floor and when it, the edges hit each other, what I was seeing through the linear activity was continuity and interruption in a simultaneous way. And that fascinated me. And so I started chopping all my drawings up and putting them back together and making them into collages like this. The collage that I do always, the material always have to be made by me. I had an experience with a friend in Sacramento who does beautiful watercolors. And she had a whole huge pile of her watercolors at her studio. And I said, why don't I take the throwaway watercolors and see if I can make a collage and do a collaborative piece? Fine. It didn't work. I couldn't do it. I had to have my hand in it from the beginning. I wish you could see this better because this is actually in the collection of Maxine and Earl. Which when I'm foundering with my work, which is often, I'll move over sometimes and paint dogs or flowers. 
and I did this. This is a composite of three of the dogs that my partner and I rescued and adopted. Three dogs, one bowl. And it's a collective and in Europe. Thank you.